my name is Oliver. Um, like I said, I'm director of security and compliance at Taxbit. Before joining Taxbit, I was at Uber, head of cloud security for about five years. And before that, I worked at Microsoft in Redmond in various positions, mostly Windows, Windows security, but also Office and a little bit of Azure. So the first question is, is cloud security really important? Is it a thing? And I would think so. But this is something I often hear, right? It's in the cloud, so we don't have to worry about it. It's taken care of by, by Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Alibaba. They take care of security. Well, if that's the case, why do we see this high number of security incidents, data breaches in the cloud? Right? We see State Farm, Capital One, Uber had a few incidents. Who is to blame? Is it Microsoft, Amazon, Google, or is it these companies? It depends, right? There's a shared responsibility between the cloud service provider and the customer. So to simplify it, the cloud service provider is responsible for security of the infrastructure. The physical security, um, hypervisor, and the infrastructure itself. As a customer, we are responsible for data security, application security, identity and access management, also network security, which is uh, firewalls, security groups, and also compliance and data governance. The good news is the CSP can actually help. They provide guidance, they have experience, but they are not responsible. And that's really important to, to understand as a customer. <clears throat> it can get complicated if you have a, a very diverse set of services. Right? So for example, you might have a service running in AWS. You might consume platform services from Google. You might even have a third-party service, which is based on Azure. But so now it becomes really tricky to manage this risk. And what if anything happens to any of those? You can mitigate it by providing redundancy. You can have multiple cloud providers and, and basically duplicate everything. Or you accept the risk and manage it with your partners. But can you really rely on those CSPs? Right? Are they 100% reliable and available? Well, not always. Right? So you might have heard about Cloud Nordic. Um, they actually lost their customers' data in ransomware attack. It's, it's unrecoverable. It's gone. Right? And that's a big risk as a customer. But also Amazon and Microsoft, they have outages at least once a year right? that really impact your services. So what does a cloud security team actually do? So typically, there are a number of functions. One is really provisioning of resources in the cloud. What I mean by that is if anybody wants to create a compute instance, maybe, they come to the cloud security team or service, and we make sure it gets provisioned in a secure way with secure defaults, patched, and ready to go. There's access control. The team also defines secure baselines which is basically what are your requirements for compliance and security reasons. For example, you might say logging has to be enabled, um, data has to be encrypted at rest by default. You don't allow open security groups, which means everything is open to the internet. And then you monitor against those baselines and you make sure that you cannot deviate from those. Attack surface reduction and management, that's really important that you understand your attack surface and, and try to minimize it as much as possible. Vulnerability management, right? Just like on-prem, you have to manage your, your containers, your VMs in the cloud. And you do monitoring and detection and alerting. And that's a close collaboration with incident management and, and SOC. And finally, you also provide guidance Right, you look at designs, architectures, and you look at cloud security aspects, and you try to find issues before they get implemented. So how does cloud security work with threat intelligence, incident management, and secure operations? So let's start with threat intel. So typically, threat intel collects information and monitors sources like um, cloud service providers, 
public forums, uh, even the dark web, and government agencies like uh, CISA in the US or the BSE in Germany. Incident management can then use this information to understand attacks, to understand the motivation of the attacker, but also the pattern that is being used. Incident response can also provide insights to cloud security, so they can see how effective are alerts that are designed for the cloud, what are the false positive rates, are there any gaps in monitoring, is there anything that's not detected but reported by third parties maybe. Cloud security can help to respond to incidents, right? so we can automate some of the response, so we can, for example, store logs in a secure location the moment we see an attack, we can take snapshots of compute instances, and we can block IPs or IP ranges if an attack is ongoing. This can be fully automated, it can be a workflow, that's really up to the risk and, and benefit analysis. The security team also informs the SOC and incident response of ongoing activity. So, for example, if there's a pen test happening, it might generate a lot of alerts. Right? So you can either inform the incident response, or if you're more sophisticated, you can suppress these alerts for a certain asset for a certain time period. And finally, we use threat intelligence information to prioritize vulnerabilities. So it's not a static priority, it, it changes over time. So I talked about the attack surface. Um, well, what is it? Right? It's really everything that comprises your cloud footprint. Right? Data stores, the network layer, um, compute instances. I just want to call out a few interesting ones. Um, one is third-party services. If you take dependencies, like we saw in the example before, you have to manage those as part of your attack surface. If you consume third-party software packages, that's part of your supply chain, also adds to your attack surface. And the last one is interesting, that's what we call rogue accounts. And these are accounts that you might not even know about. One example is if you, you're running everything in AWS, you might have somebody in marketing opening a GCP project and you don't even know about it. Or somebody just uses their corporate credit card and they create an account in AWS which is not part of your organization. And these are really difficult to find and understand. One thing we did at Uber, we actually worked with AWS to find these and make it easy to, to terminate them. So what are some best practices? You want to, to minimize the attack service or maximize utilization. So you shut down everything that's not needed. Um, you look at data stores that are not, not being used anymore. If you do prototyping, you clean up after you're done, ideally. It's often often forgotten. You deduplicate code and data. You don't store the same data over and over again in different locations. You try to keep it in one location. You enforce lifecycle policies, so data gets deleted when it's no longer needed. That's also a compliance requirement. There might be a legal hold, which means you cannot delete the data, and that's something you also need to manage in your system. And you can also set scaling limits. And this is really important to protect against DDoS attacks. Crypto mining, right? Some adversaries, they try to get into your system and use it for crypto mining, and suddenly you have to pay millions of dollars for compute. Or even economic denial of service. And this is really very destructive adversaries. They just try to make you pay a lot of money. Right? So they just increase your cost and might even kick you out of business. And you follow the principle of least privilege, which means you only give permissions that are needed to perform the business. So how do we, how do we prune the attack service and minimize it? <clears throat> this is something we did at Uber. So we looked at assets in the cloud that seem inactive. One challenge is if they are inactive, chances are the ownership information might be outdated because they're old, they haven't been used in a while, the team might no longer exist that, that developed this, this system, and you need to find good ownership information. So if you have an owner and you see 
the asset is actively being used, then you do nothing, right? Then that's, that's the default, that's how it should be. If the asset is being used, but you don't know who owns it, then, well, you can analyze the logs and try to find out who might be the owner and then get that information updated. If there's no owner, but it's not used, then you might delete this, that you might block access to it, wait for, let's say, two months. If nothing happens, you just delete it. If you know who the owner is, but it's not being used, you just ask the owner, can you delete this, or do you still need it? Right? And this can also be automated as a workflow. Here's one example of uh, a workflow we did in Google Cloud. So it's, it's a scheduler, so it's run every day. We look for activities, we look for um, products that are not active at all, maybe for 90 days. If we find one, we can also look at the cost that's used for prioritization. Then we store this finding in a data store, like, like Firestore in this case, and we create a tracking ticket, in our case in Jira. Here's what a ticket might look like. So we assign it to the owner if we have the information, um, provide information. It's not really a vulnerability, but that's, that's our template. What's interesting here, Google provides information about the carbon footprint. That's another incentive to delete the project. This one is pretty small, but uh, some are really significant. And that's one of the additional benefits or motivators to look at the attack surface and reduce cost, carbon footprint, and attack surface. And with... Yeah, you can also prevent DDoS and, and DDoS attacks, like I said, by, by setting boundaries. So that's partially automated, I think. It's a workflow. Um, but what else can we automate? Here's another example. This time, it's, I believe, AWS. So it starts maybe with an engineer opening the SSH port for everyone, the entire world. And that's something that is not allowed by our security baseline and something we want to prevent. So there's a CloudTrail event, and our monitoring system gets the event and compares it with our monitoring rules. It's a violation, so we, we do create a ticket, again, in, in JIRA, and we might notify the engineer depending on the severity of the issue. Email, Slack, whatever works. The engineer can now fix the issue, remediate it. There's another cloud real event, again, picked up by our system, and we close the ticket automatically. So the engineer doesn't have to go into JIRA, they don't have to acknowledge the ticket, they don't have to close it. That's all automated. Like I said, ownership can be tricky, right? Who owns an EC2 instance? Who owns a database? It's not always well-maintained and well-defined. Sometimes we have to play detective and, and analyze the logs and see who is using this. We might also look at historical data and see, did anybody fix security issues in the past for this? If we don't have information for a database, do we know who owns the project or account that database belongs to? And then we can reach out to potential owners and update our inventory data. At Uber, we actually developed a service for this, just trying to guess who the owner is of an asset. So now we want to target our automation. Technically, you can automate almost everything, but there's always the risk of breaking your service or your application if you do so. So what we, we look for is the risk of the vulnerability minus the risk of breaking things by automatically fixing it. And then we also look at the cost of implementation. <clears throat> so if the risk is high and the risk of breaking things is not high, then the data is high. But if the cost of implementation is high, then we want to further investigate to see is there a better way to automate this. If the cost is low, we just do it. But we implement the auto-remediation 
and it's taken care of, and we eliminate a class of vulnerabilities this way. Right? So this vulnerability will always be automatically fixed. If the risk of breaking things is high in relation to the risk of the vulnerability, and the cost is high, then we, we just skip it. Right? If the cost is low, but there's still a risk of breaking things, then we, instead of automating the whole thing, we can implement a workflow. We can create a ticket automatically. We ask the owner to confirm. This can be just a yes, no button. We can also say, if we don't hear back, we just do it in 30 days. But so you can be very flexible in how you enforce and implement these workflows. Here's one example from AWS. There's actually a managed rule. It's about S3 buckets that don't have server-side encryption enabled. Now, server-side encryption is very easy to turn on, and it doesn't break anything. There's no reason not to turn it on, really. Right? So you can automate the whole thing. And AWS Config actually allows you to to define those automation scripts. They have building blocks, and you can, you can just implement it, or you can, you can add your custom script. Like in our case, we wanted to create a tracking ticket, even if we automatically fix it, for documentation reasons, compliance, and, and so forth. Typically, these rules are triggered whenever there's a configuration change, like, like we saw in the example with the SSH port. Right? Some, somebody changes the configuration, it triggers an event, our monitoring system gets notified, and we analyze it. That's the configuration change. You can also do periodic scans. Right? Maybe every day you scan everything, and you look for misconfigurations. What I recommend is really hybrid, so you want the system to be triggered by config changes, but you also want to scan everything from time to time. And the reason is, if you have legacy systems, assets, they never change, right? And you rely on config changes, then your monitoring gets never triggered. So you want some hybrid, make sure you scan everything from time to time, maybe every other day. <clears throat> so this is all interesting, but it's really still very reactive, right? We, we see a vulnerability, we take action more or less in real time, if it's a workflow, maybe not, right? Maybe we don't hear back from the owner. So it's all very reactive and based on detection. How can we move this more towards prevention? And one answer is, I think, infrastructure as code. Right? You, you basically make sure that every configuration change is reflected in code. This could be Terraform. It could be CloudFormation. Uh, Azure ARM templates. If you're doing multi-cloud, then I would recommend Terraform because it's very agnostic and, and there are a lot of tools available for it. Um, but the big benefit is you can really analyze the config change before it gets released into production. But you can scan the code, you can run static application security testing or SAST on it. You can integrate it with your CD pipeline. You have change management. You see who approved this change, who signed off on this. And you can roll it back. Right? If something breaks, you can roll it back. You can go back to before the change. Another thing that's important is for cloud security to be involved in design and architecture reviews. Right? We don't just want to scan the infrastructure, but we want to see what is planned and is there anything that might be a security risk. And we want to identify those before they get implemented. Some tips for static code analysis or SAST. One thing is you have to make sure that all your code is under source control, including your serverless functions, Lambda functions, cloud functions. Oftentimes, they're not. Right? They're direct in the cloud, and they get missed if you scan your, your repositories. One thing that's interesting is SAS can actually find secrets in code, which is very important and, and useful. 
But you might want to consider not just scanning your code, but other documents as well, emails, um, Google Drives, maybe Slack messages. You'd be surprised how many users post an access key in Slack and say, can you take a look at this? And whenever possible, you can develop custom rules and extend your ability to find security vulnerabilities. If you're doing infrastructure as code, it really helps you to, to meet compliance requirements, right? Because you get change management, you have good documentation, and everything is documented. What else can you do? Right? You can monitor, uh, you can map your monitoring rules to compliance requirements, and you can normalize them. Right? So you might have a rule in AWS to look for S3 buckets that are unencrypted. In Google Cloud, it might be GCS buckets that are unencrypted. For compliance, it's the same thing. Right? It's unencrypted data stores. So you want to normalize them, but find a taxonomy that works for all providers and then map this to compliance requirements. You can also use tagging to identify which assets are relevant to which compliance requirement. So one example is PCI. If you do credit card processing, you can tag the account or accounts in AWS or project in GCP that are actually relevant and only focus on those for your PCI compliance reporting. You can use, or you have to use compliance to define priorities, but there might be things that are not having a huge security impact, but they are just required for compliance reasons. And then there's really no debate. I think the most interesting thing is you can automate the evidence collection for compliance. I don't know how many of you have done evidence collection. It's really painful and you take screenshots or you you try to find configuration files. If you're using infrastructure as code and you have tracking, you can just automate this. You can say, here's evidence that we have everything encrypted. Right? It's all in this code file. You can even use it to, to prove that you're reviewing policies. Right? If you have tickets that show that you, you look for policies that are maybe over permissive, and you can report on vulnerability management and remediation. So one thing we saw in the shared responsibility model is the customer owns data security. And security is in large about data, right? So data security is really maybe one of the most important aspects of cloud security or of security in general. So what does it mean? You have your asset inventory, but you have to understand what kind of data do we actually have. And that's not, not always easy, but there might be rogue accounts or data stores where you don't, don't know what's in them. And you want to classify this data. So typically, you can use tags or labels and have a standard way to, to classify and document the types of data. And this could be sensitivity of the data. It could be compliance requirements. It could also be backup requirements. How often do we need to back up this data? Lifecycle policy, right? That's another big aspect. You can enforce lifecycle management, deletion and retention. And you look at encryption, both in transit and at rest. And again, we want to automate this. So here's one example. We look for incomplete or incorrect data classification of, let's say, say buckets or data stores. Let's say we have a labeling standard. It's easy to, to check that the label exists. Right? You can just look at the, the metadata and see if the label is there. And if not, you create a ticket and say, can you please add this compliance label? You can also check the syntax. Right? Let's say we have uh, sensitivity, sensitivity levels from 1, 2, and 3. If somebody writes, I don't know, that's not a good answer. Right? It has to be a number. 
if the data store is labeled as having sensitive data, then we assume it's encrypted. Your automation can verify that it's encrypted. If not, again, you create a ticket. If it's labeled as not having sensitive data, you might want to double check and, and sample the data and see, do we find anything that looks like it might be sensitive? So how do we check for encryption? And what does it mean to have data encrypted? Right, there are three levels or four if you count not having encryption. The first one is really server-side encryption, and the key is, is managed by the service provider. Right, so the data is not encrypted. You put it in a bucket or a data store, and on the machine, it's encrypted by the service provider. It's not very useful, but it's, it's a start. The second level is that you hold the keys. Right, so it gives you a bit more control about the encryption. And level three is really what we call client-side encryption. It means you encrypt the data before you put it in the data store. We typically do both, server-side and client-side encryption. You might say it's redundant, but uh, yeah, there's no downside, really. So how do you verify that it's encrypted? Right? If it's server-side encryption, you can just check the, the settings, the configuration, and if it's encrypted, you're good to go. If you're looking for client-side encryption, it depends on what kind of data you're looking at. If it's a known file type, you might do something like look at the file header. Um, one thing we did at Uber is because we, we didn't know what kind of objects are actually stored in a bucket, we looked at the uh, entropy of the objects. And if the entropy is very high, that's a measure for the randomness of the, the bytes in the file, then we assume it's encrypted. And it turned out to be very accurate. Now, if the data is marked as not sensitive, you still want to sample it and, and see, can we find anything that, that might be sensitive? Is it maybe mislabeled? <clears throat> and typically, you're looking for PII, or personally identifiable information. And it's not always clear and obvious what it means. Right? Like a name could be, if it's a first name, Maybe not, right? You cannot identify a person just by looking at the first name in most cases. Phone number is probably PII. Address might be. Um, and you also might want to look for data patterns or identifiers that are unique to your business. Maybe you have a different way to identify customer IDs or user numbers, user IDs. At Uber, we looked at uh, things like driver license information, at our custom IDs, and if we find them, then we assume that the data is sensitive. There are quite a few commercial solutions. We found them to be very expensive and not super efficient, so we used open source. We implemented our own custom rules. And one thing to consider is really localization, right? If you, if you are global, names, addresses, phone numbers are different depending on, on the country. <clears throat> so you might use something like, like this, right? You can easily find uh, regexes for all kinds of, of data types, even localized. Another interesting aspect of data security or challenge is really how do you enable engineers to work with production data without exposing the data to them? Right? So like a text bit, we have very sensitive data from the US government. Our engineers don't have access to the data, but they want to see what does the system look like. So we need to anonymize the data. Anonymize. So you can substitute parts of the data sets. You can do shuffling, or you just mask some of the data. So for example, you might substitute the real social security number with something fake. Right, and then you'd lose that 
piece of information, but you can still do prototyping. You can look at the dashboard. What does it look like? You can run your tests, and you don't expose the real data to your engineers. Or you can mask it, right? You, you just X out the credit card numbers, and you enable engineers to, to work with the data. So another, I think, interesting aspect of cloud security is really vulnerability management, right? And this might be VMs, it might be containers. You have to, just like on-prem, make sure everything is scanned, identified, and patched. So scanning can be done. Again, it can be triggered if a new EC2 instance comes up. Almost in real time, you can, you can scan it and, and see, is there anything vulnerable? Or you just do it on a daily basis. There are CVSS scores, right? You can try to prioritize based on those. You can also modify them based on, on your business. In some cases, a vulnerability might be so severe that you, you treat it like an incident. One example was uh, block for shell You just assume that it's being exploited. You don't wait, right? You say, this is like an incident. Fix it now. Once you get your, your scan results, you can enrich the data. Again, you can hopefully find ownership information, who's the security contact, who's the engineering contact. You can also look at data intelligence. So what, what is the data behind this vulnerability? Is it, is it sensitive? Is it maybe encrypted? But if it's encrypted and somebody might get access to it, it's maybe less of a risk. Or is it redundant? Maybe it's a backup. This might impact your, your security score. The environment is also important. If we, let's say we have a sandbox environment with um, mass data, then it's probably less, less severe than if it's in production. You can also look at the attack graph and see how can this be exploited? Is this public? Is it internal? What can somebody get to this vulnerability through a public endpoint? Some best practices. You can spend a lot of time trying to, to calculate the optimal severity level. But in some cases, it might be just easier to, to fix it. I've seen teams spending eight weeks trying to prove that a vulnerability is not critical, but just, just high. You could have, could have just fixed it. Right? Um, but you can also look at things like auto-patching. Right? You can use AWS auto-patching, and um, it's taken care of for you. You can and should use managed base images if you have containers, for example. So these are patched every week by the cloud service provider. So you don't have to do it. You still have to test it. You have to make sure it's working. But you basically rely, not rely, but you get assistance from the service provider. You also want to be able to, to test your patched system. So make it part of your CICD pipeline. Make sure it works in staging, and then roll it out to production. All right, we have about four minutes. So in conclusion, I think some takeaways are really don't just look at cloud security in isolation. Right? And I've seen this quite often that teams just run a cloud security scanner and they get, get vulnerability data without any context, 20,000 findings, now go and fix them. Right? But you need to understand the context of your business, what kind of data are you dealing with, what's your attack service, and so forth. Secondly, you want to automate as much as possible. Right? Remediation, scanning, everything. I think you want to prioritize data security over other aspects, because it's mostly about data. Again, that might depend on your business, but um, it's something that you own as a customer of a cloud service provider. And finally, you want to, to manage the attack service and, and keep it to a minimum. All right, uh, any questions? So
So we let them think for a moment. It's your turn. So, Olimar, I think <laughs> uh, one one question: How long will you stay with us? I'm leaving on Saturday. Okay, so you will be be here tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great. So I'm quite sure people will come. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please. Okay. So I say thank you very much for the insights. Um, what you did with Uber. And yeah, it was a great talk. Thank you again. Thank you.